The text this morning is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. These are the words of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Gracious God and Father, we commit this time to you. We ask that your spirit would have his way with us. I pray you'd take this word and apply it to our hearts. Drive it into our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In order to work through a series of messages on parenting, which is what this is, it is necessary to pay some attention to the parents themselves. The parents are the ones doing the work, and the quality of the participle, the parenting, is going to be dependent on the quality of the source. If the parent is foolish, then so will the parenting be. If the parent is dictatorial, so will the parenting be. If the parent is wise, so will the parenting be. So rather than turning immediately to the interactions between parent and child, it is necessary to look first at the relationship between the parent and God. So there are two great commandments, love the Lord your God with everything you've got, and then the second one is like unto it, love your neighbors yourself. The relationship of parent to child is a second commandment issue. But before we address the second commandment issue, how are you treating your neighbor, we have to talk about the relationship between God and man, the relationship between God and the, and the father in question, or God and the mother in, in question. So that is what we're going to be focusing on here today. Let's work through this passage first. Every Christian, regardless of their station, needs to present their bodies and whatever it is their bodies are doing as a living sacrifice to God. Your bed is an altar, your car is an altar, your chair at the dinner table is an altar, and from that place, all day long, you present your body and whatever it is your body is doing as a sacrifice to God. That's verse 1. And it says that the tail end of verse 1, which is your reasonable service, a good translation of that word for service would, would be, which is your reasonable worship. When Isaiah is uh, has a vision of the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. And the Lord says, who's going to go for me? Uh, and Isaiah says, here am I, send me. That is the demeanor of worship. Worship is making yourself available for service. Worship is saying, this is what I want. I, I want to do what you want me to do. What is that thing? When you gather for worship, that's what you're doing. You're worshiping God. You're presenting yourself as available for service. And, and so when your body is being offered up as a living sacrifice, wherever you're sitting, wherever you're standing, wherever you're walking, that is an altar that is being offered up to God. Everything you are and do is to, is to be presented as an offering to God, and that is your reasonable worship. This is a spiritual uh, duty. And notice that your spiritual duty of worship is manifested, is, is manifested by what you do with your physical body. So to be, being spiritual does not mean to be ethereal. Being spiritual does not mean to be like a wispy ghost. Being spiritual means being obedient. God made you body, soul, and spirit, and all of you needs to be offered up to God. And when you offer up your body as a living sacrifice to God, this is a spiritual action. So this is worship. So everything you, every, everything you stand on, everything you sit on, everything you lie on, that is an altar. Now, this would include speaking to your children, it would include disciplining your children, it would include encouraging your children, it would include teaching your children. Everything you do, all your interactions between you and your children are on the altar and, and are an offering to God. What you do in this era, in this area, needs to be acceptable to God and it needs to be offered up as a reasonable act of worship. Remember that Cain worshiped God. He, presented an offering, and Cain's offering was rejected because it was not an acceptable offering. And uh, Abel worshipped God and presented an offering to God, and his offering was acceptable. 
So it's not just enough to go into God's presence and say, here's something I'm offering you. It's, the worship has to be an acceptable worship. It has to be something that he will receive. All right, so uh, your body, your, your body being offered as a living sacrifice wherever you are, when you're admonishing your child, when you're teaching your child, when you're disciplining your child, that needs to be something that's being done on the altar, and it's got to be offered up to God in worship, and it's got to be worship that God finds acceptable. That is, that is acceptable or reasonable act of worship. Now, we are created as conforming creatures. And so it's not a matter of whether we are going to conform to a pattern, but rather which pattern we are going to conform to. Paul says here that, uh, that it is not to be the pattern that is assigned by the world, verse 2. Not to be the pattern assigned by the world. J.B. Phillips' translation of this passage says, Do not let the world press you into its mold. The world has a mold that it wants you to conform to, and it pushes you into that mold. And the Apostle Paul says, Don't have anything to do with that. Don't let the world press you into its mold. Don't be conformed to what the world wants you to do. But, ra but notice, it's not, Don't be conformed to the world and go over there and be your own autonomous libertarian blob, doing autonomy, uh, autonomously doing whatever it is you want to do. No, it's don't be conformed to the world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you're going to be conformed to something. You're going to be conformed to the world's way of thinking, or you're going to be conformed to God's way of thinking. Either it's going to be the world or God. So don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And when you do that, you're conforming to the entire goodness of the will of God, which is in verse 2. And then we come to the, uh, to the cash payout. We come, we come to the place where we see whether or not verses 1 and 2 are being done. Number one, uh, verse 1 uh, says, present your bodies. And you could say, well, yes, that's what I've done. Well, that's what Cain said. You know, Cain said, I've worshipped the Lord. You can say you've done that, verse 1. And you can say that you've conformed to verse 2. Oh, no, I don't conform to worldly patterns. I'm transformed by the renew renewing of the mind. Well, how do we tell if that's actually happening? We can tell in verse 3. This is where it all plays out. It plays out in what we think of ourselves, it plays out what you think of God and what you think of your neighbor is going to be readily seen in how you think of yourself. Do not think of yourself more highly than you should, verse 3. Do not, do not entertain lofty thoughts of yourself. Don't think of yourself more highly than you should, but rather think of yourself in a God-given and sensible way. Sophroneo is the word there, which is your reasonable uh, where it says, um, but to think soberly in the, in the KJV, to think soberly, to think sensibly, to think humbly of yourself. The transformation being spoken of is a transformation that results in humility. This is a if, you're, if you're not conformed to the world and you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, you are being transformed into a, a posture and a demeanor of humility. And this posture and demeanor of humility budgets for the possibility that you may be wrong. That's what it does. It doesn't insist that you are wrong. It doesn't insist that you give up all your perspectives and all your opinions and all your thoughts and all your observations about child rearing. It doesn't demand that you just set them down and walk away without reflection. What it demands is that you be willing to. That's, what it, it, that's the point of surrender. When you surrender to God, you are not saying that all my critics are right about everything. You're not saying that all the people who've criticized my, parent, uh, my child rearing, that they're right about everything. You, well, they might not be. They might be as self-deceived as you have sometimes been. What it means is that you have to budget for that possibility. If you're not being conformed to the world, but you're transformed by the renewal of your mind, what does the apostle tell you? The apostle says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. And we all have a tendency to do that. We all have a tendency to think of ourselves. We, we judge others by their words and their actions, and we judge ourselves by our motives and our intentions. We know what our motives were. We know what our intentions were. And so we think, well, I meant well. That conversation didn't go well, but I meant well. 
And so I, I evaluate myself accordingly. But if they, not, if they initiated the conversation and it didn't go well, we, we think they were just picking a fight. They, why? Because I evaluate them on the basis of their external actions and their words only, and I evaluate, I evaluate myself on the basis of what I thought I was trying to do. And we, we all tend to conjugate verbs this way, right? We all, we all flatter ourselves. This is how we conjugate the verb. I am firm, you are obstinate, he is pig-headed. And the farther we get away from ourselves, the more severe the judgment. But this kind of transformation, the transformation that is accomplished by verse 3, is a transformation that results in humility. Now, humility is not relativism. Humility is not let, let me go through life let, with everybody else telling me what to think. Humility is not being a doormat. Humility simply acknowledges the possibility and is willing to check with God about it, is willing to surrender the point in principle. And if, that, if the Holy Spirit convicts you, well and good. If, you, uh, if someone criticizes you or you have a controversy or clash with someone and you decide, no, I think I, I, think I need to stick to my guns here, that's great too. What you, what you can't do is simply assume that you're in the right. That's what you can't do. Because that's what the world does. Don't be conformed to the world's way of doing it, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I want to talk about three kinds of parents. There are three kinds of parents, and you are, generally speaking, going to be in one of these categories. You're going to be in one of these categories. But let's set this up first. Parents are assigned the rule of their children. Parents are rulers. Parents make decisions. When your child is first born, they are absolutely helpless. When they are three years old, they don't think they're helpless, but they are still helpless. They still think it's okay to play in the street. They still think it's okay to stick a table knife in the electrical outlet. They, they, ha they still need parents. They need guidance. They need oversight. And so they need to be ruled. Little children need to be ruled. Children are instructed to obey their parents, Ephesians 6.1. They are told that they must honor their parents, with the next verse, Ephesians 6.2. They are told that their responsibilities to their parents do change over time, but some sort of responsibility is always there. Mark 7, 10, and 11. Jesus says, uh, uh, the word of God says, honor your father and mother, but you took the money that was going to support them, and you gave it to the temple. You donated it to the temple, and he said, thus you set aside the word of God for the sake of, sake of your tradition. So the commandment to honor parents is not a commandment that ever expires. Exodus 20, verse 12. The commandment to honor your father and mother never expires. So we can see, if we put all of this together, that parents are assigned the rule of their children as they grow. <coughs> parents, um, parents don't rule grown children, children who have, uh, are out of the nest, children who have... Uh, we see the pattern from the very beginning. A man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two become one flesh. So the, the family is designed not to grow into a huge tribe with one patriarch at the head of the tribe. Rather, a man leaves his father and mother, establishes a new household. So grown, grown children still must honor their parents, but they honor their parents differently than the, uh, dependent children do. Dependent children honor their parents by submitting graciously and thankfully to the process of being ruled. So uh, children uh, are in this position. Dependent children are in this position. That being the case, we can divide parents up into the three broad categories of rulers that we find in Scripture. If parents are rulers, they are a subset of all rulers, and the Bible tells us what rulers can be like. First, a ruler can be foolish and indulgent. A ruler can be foolish and indulgent, Proverbs 25.5. Probably the best example of, a, of an indulgent ruler would be Aaron in the golden calf incident. In Exodus 32.25, Moses sees that Aaron had lost control. The people were running riot, and it was because of Aaron's um, incompetence in leadership. So Aaron was not the kind of ruler that he ought to have been, and he let the people get away from him. The people got, and they ran headlong into sin. So Aaron was a foolish and indulgent leader. A ruler can be foolish and dictatorial. 
Exodus 4.13, or back at the other end of Exodus. Uh, that's the way Pharaoh was. In the first chapter of Exodus, Pharaoh orders the, all the uh, Hebrew uh, boy babies be exposed and, and killed. Uh, that is tyrannical. That's dictatorial. That is a ruler who devours his people rather than a ruler who feeds his people. You see that actually in the Gospel of Mark where you have the juxtaposition of um, Jesus feeding the, the people by the sea. And in, right next to that, you have Herod's banquet where jo the head of John the Baptist is brought out on a serving platter. So you have one king feeding the people and another king right next door eating the people. Uh, one, one king feeds the people, one king eats the people. Third category is a ruler can be wise and prudent, Proverbs 20, verse 26. So those are the three kinds of rulers, foolish and indulgent. A ruler can be foolish and dictatorial, or a ruler can be wise and prudent. Bring this down into the micro kingdom of the home. Parents can be indulgent, parents can be tyrannical, and parents can be authoritative and wise. Those are the three broad categories. If you're a parent, you're in one of those categories, broadly speaking. You're either more indulgent than you ought to be, or you're stricter than you ought to be, dictatorial, or you're doing a decent job. Now, here's the, here's the difficulty. If, if you look at verse 3, you can see, I think you can put all this together, uh, the, the biggest challenge to your sanctification in any area of life uh, but particularly in this area of life, the biggest challenge to your sanctification is going to be self-deception. Don't let anyone think of himself more highly than he ought. You're gonna, if your tendency is going to be to think that you're doing a better job than you're actually doing. You're going to call what you're doing by another name. All right, so self-deception is the central challenge to every task involved in our sanctification. Parents can be indulgent, Parents can be tyrannical, and parents can be authoritative and wise. Now, in the very nature of the case, the wise parents are going to be humble and therefore not that sure about how wise they are being. All right, so when, when someone says, hey, I, that, that was really wise, you're doing a great job, they're going to say, well, thank the Lord, but we'll see. We'll see. They're, going to be, they're going to budget for the possibility that they're not doing as well as people say or not doing as well as they might assume. So they're not going to be that sure about how wise they are being. The dictatorial parent thinks that he's simply being firm. That's what he calls it. He thinks he's being firm. And, and I'm preaching this series of sermons. The title of the series is Biblical Child Discipline in an Age of Therape Therapeutic Goo. The world outside is a, a, an indulgent world. They want kids to be able to do virtually anything they want without correction, without admonition. And so the world is an indulgent world, and that indulgence creeps into the church. A lot of Christian parents are, are being indulgent right along with the external world. And then some parents react to that. They see the indulgence, they see how bad it is outside, and they embrace what they call being firm, but they're not firm at all. They're being dictatorial, they're being tyrannical. So the dictatorial parent thinks he's simply being firm, and the indulgent parent thinks she is simply being kind. The dictatorial uh, parent calls it something else. The indulgent parent calls it something else. On top of that, an indulgent parent can just believe that she's balancing out the dictatorial parent, who is the other one, right? So the indulgent parent is balancing out the firmness of the dictatorial parent, and so they each lean opposite ways in the canoe, which is, incidentally, how you capsize a canoe. So regardless, no one should think of themselves more highly than they ought to think. Now, also, I, I want to uh, include under the heading of indulgent parent, there are indulgent parents who see what's going on and reinterpret it radically, but there are other parents who are indulgent who just don't see. They, you know, they're busy thinking great thoughts in their head. They're just, they're just not aware of what's going on at all. But that's a, that's a form of indulgence as well. Now, we should always uh, remember our propensity to guard against the sin we are least likely to fall into. We have a natural tendency to guard against the sin that we are unlikely to be tempted by. The indulgent parent 
is all on his guard against tyranny, and the tyrannical father is being very careful not to be too soft. The tyrannical father says, oh, I don't know, you, you can't be too soft on your kids. And then the indulgent parent, oh, I don't want to be a tyrant. So Pharaoh doesn't want to be like Aaron. Pharaoh doesn't want the people to run amok. Pharaoh wants to maintain control with a firm hand. He doesn't want chaos in the streets the way Aaron got chaos in the streets. And Aaron doesn't want to be like Pharaoh. He doesn't want to devour the people. So we're all, re uh, we're all reacting to the, the sin or the temptation that we're not likely to fall into. Remember this observation from Screwtape. The game is to have them all running about with fire extinguishers when there's a flood and all crowding to that side of the boat, which is already nearly gunnel under. What we do is we react to the wrong thing. We think, we think up that we're susceptible to the thing we're not susceptible to, and so we veer in the wrong direction. So what do we do? Is, is the situation hopeless? What do we do? At this point, it's easy to throw up our hands and mock despair and lament the fact that this is just too hard to figure out. But perhaps the problem is not that it's too hard to figure out, but rather that we are too hard to want to figure it out. It might not be too hard to figure out. It might be that we are too hard to figure out. It might be we are too hard to want to figure it out. And here's Lewis again. Uh, he wrote an essay called The Trouble with X, which is a great essay. I commend it to you. Um, but this is just a selection from that essay. It is no good passing this over with some vague general admission, such as, of course, I know I have my faults. It is important to realize that there is some really fatal flaw in, in you, something which gives the others just that same feeling of despair which their flaws give you. But why, you ask, don't the others tell me? Believe me, they've tried to tell you over and over again, and you just couldn't take it. And even the faults you do know, you don't know fully. You say, I admit I lost my temper last night, but the others know that you're always doing it, that you are a bad-tempered person. So what happened? Why, why don't people approach me? Why don't people tell me that I have a temper problem? Because you'd lose your temper. <laughs> they, they know not to go there. They've tried to go there. They've tried to bring it up, and there are many, many situations where someone who is not open, if someone is not open to have the Lord or the Spirit or the text or their friends tell them the truth, if they're not open, they can make their lack of openness very, uh, very apparent, and they can get all prickly when someone tries to help out. Now, what are we doing here? In this congregation, when we baptize an infant, not only do the parents take covenant vows, so does the congregation. Do you promise to help these parents in the Christian nurture of this child? If so, signify that by saying amen. And we all say amen. And it's a, and it's a heartwarming moment. Yay, another baby baptized. But, but, in three years, that child, that's, that very same child, baptized and all, might be careening around here or might be careening around the cookie table like a chimpanzee on meth, right? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Fistfuls of cookies. And if one of the parents remembers the vow we all took back in that heartwarming moment and, and attempts to talk to the parents, how easy is it to get defensive? This is the answer. Very easy to get defensive. Extremely easy to get defensive. And your, your mouth, your heart, and your mouth is full of arguments that are, on paper, good arguments. This person who's talking to you does not know, does, does not know that child's name. And you do know that child's name. They don't know the child's favorite food. You say, well, yes, I do. It'd be cookies. <laughs> I, they, don't, they, they, they don't know your child's bedtime. They, yes, I do. They, they, don't, they don't have a bedtime. Whatever bedtime they want, that's their bedtime. Well, let's say that the person who's being defensive, the parent who's being defensive is right about all this question. You don't know this. You don't know this. You don't know this. But the person who's observing this can say, yes, but I do know one thing that you don't know, and that is that your kid has you whipped. I know that because I see it. Sunday after Sunday. They do, they do what they want to do. 
We see that your discipline is ineffectual. We see that you don't even see the need for discipline. And then when you do speak, it's just totally and completely ignored. I've seen that over and over again. So, huh, this is awkward. So what do you do? Do you throw up your hands in mock despair and say, oh, we're all just a piece of work and we'll just have to muddle through? No. Why not ask? It's far easier to take critical input when you have asked for it, than when it is volunteered. When someone finally gets to the point of needing to feel, where they feel like they need to say something to you, the chances are probably pretty good that the situation is, is kind of dire, kind of extreme, and you're not predisposed to receive it. If you ask, if you inquire, the chances are pretty good that you're going to be far more receptive to be able to hear what is said. So begin by asking God. Whatever, so be, why not ask? Begin by asking God. Ask God to reveal where you actually are on this map of parental demeanor. Are you indulgent? Are you tyrannical, dictatorial? Or are you in the middle? Are you doing what you ought to do? Are you indulgent? Are you harsh? Are you kind and wise? Now, let, let me ask a simple question. Does God know the answer to that question? Does God know if you're indulgent? Does God know if you're harsh? Does God know if you're in the middle, if you're, if you're doing a, a reasonable job? Now, there's always a ditch on both sides of the road. The harsh parents are in one ditch, the indulgent parents are in the other ditch, and the parents who are doing okay are standing on the yellow line. They're, they're, they might wobble a little bit, but they're basically in the road. Now, the harsh parents in the right ditch, for them, the parent on, in the middle of the road is far too close to the indulgent ditch. And for the people in the indulgent ditch, the person who's standing on the yellow line is far too close to the harsh line. I don't, we don't want to be harsh. And they crit, they're critical from their respective ditches. Well, begin by asking God, because he knows. He knows exactly where you are, and he is willing to let you know. He is willing to answer this prayer. God, I, w I really want to know where I am. I really want to know if I'm indulgent. I want to know if I'm harsh. I want to know if I'm being a reasonable parent. I want to know. Now, if you want to know, do you think God wants you to know? Yeah, and he knows. If you want to know, does he want you to know? Yes, verse 3 says that he wants you to know. Verse 3 says that you ought not to think of yourself more highly than you ought. That means God wants you to know where you are. Don't deceive yourself. God wants you to stop deceiving yourself. So, ask God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. That's in Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Now, when we ask God to search us, we are asking, God, we're asking the omniscient one to do the searching. He knows the answer. He knows the answer. And the, the, the problem is not too hard for him. Are we too hard to hear the answer? Well, we need to surrender the whole thing in principle. When you, when you talk to God, you're surrendering the point in principle. Now, that doesn't mean that you're surrendering the point because somebody might think you're harsh when you actually are simply being firm. Right? Somebody, uh, the when... Moses told the Levites to strap on the sword and go deal with those people. Some of those people would have thought that Moses was being harsh, but Moses was doing right. So, so don't, don't try to get yourself into the, the horizontal perspective. Just ask, what does God think, and what does, how is God going to communicate what he thinks to you? Either from the Word, with the Spirit convicting you in a time like this, or from family and friends. And this would be, after you have surrendered the point in principle to God, having humbled yourself in this way, then ask one further thing from God. Ask him to speak to you through your family and friends. Ask God to speak to you through your family and friends. Then go to your family and friends and tell them to please be straight with you. Just say, we've got a lot of little ones in this house. We've got a lot going on. I, wanted to do, I want to do a periodic check on how I'm doing. And you ask different people. P 
people who are in a position to observe. Please be straight with me. If they are critical, you promise not to get angry, and you promise not to go weird on them. All right, if, do, I, do I have a short temper with the kids? And they say yes, and then you blow up. There, there it is. There we go. Or they tell you, yes, you, have a, you are sometimes really harsh with the kids, and then you don't talk to them for six months. That's what I mean by going weird. You say, I'm not going to let your answer to this question affect our relationship, but I would like to know, from your perspective, am I harsh, am I indulgent, or am I uh, being reasonable? Would you describe, what, what would you describe me as being? Now, don't, don't just do this with one person and then go put their opinion in the bank. And you know why, right? Because you would pick the one person that you think would give you the right answer. <laughs> you probably know someone who's just like you. You probably know someone who would give you the right answer. What you want to do is get a range. Ask five to ten people and see if you start to notice a pattern. You do not need to, now, when they give you their input, you don't need to just flat out believe what, it, what anybody says. But you do have an obligation to listen before God without being defensive. That's the issue. The issue is not, I'm going to, I'm going to ask five to ten people to criticize me, and I'm going to write down whatever they say and go do whatever they say. No, you prayerfully take it back to God, prayerfully talk with your wife or talk with your husband about it. You prayerfully consider it without being defensive, and then you make your decision. And that decision might disagree with the person who came to you. The person you asked might have been someone you were thinking about approaching yourself about what they were doing. And uh, this whole thing came up first. So you have an obligation to not be defensive. You asked. You asked. Yeah, you say, uh, yeah, I asked, but it was only because a preacher in a sermon made me. I didn't want to ask. Too many Christians have adopted the foolish approach to automotive maintenance, which is don't lift the hood if you don't want to know. Well, that's not the way to go. Don't lift the hood if you don't want to know means that you're not going to deal with the problem until it's dire. It's really, it's really bad. There are many problems that could have been corrected with a minimal intervention earlier, but if you put it off, put it off, put it off, big things going to happen. If, if you just changed the oil earlier, then this wouldn't have happened. When the, when the engine freezes up and everything blows up and catches on fire, that's a different issue. Also, something else. If someone takes this exhortation to heart and comes to you and asks you what you think, be gracious and kind, but don't lie to them. If someone takes this sermon to heart and, and asks you, what, what, where would you place me on the spectrum, and you think that they're harsh, <coughs> but you think that they wouldn't, they're not really, they're not going to receive that right now, and so you couch your response in all sorts of ambiguities, don't do that. Don't, don't be severe. Don't be harsh yourself. Be gracious and kind, but tell the truth. Many people in their marriages, many people in their friendships, try to build koinonia fellowship on the foundation of lying. They try to build, they, they want peace. And so they will make peace by apologizing when they don't think they ought to or don't think they need to. Or they will make, they will give a soft answer when a straight answer was requested. So don't lie for the sake of a, a superficial peace. The last thing, what is love? As you, as you evaluate the parenting that is going on in your home, do not attempt in the first instance to tinker with the fruit. Don't, the fruit's in the basket. The fruit's out there in the produce uh, stand ready for sale. Don't go try to fix the blemishes on the fruit now. All your initial attention should be given to the tree. Well, how's the tree doing? We need to deal with the soil. We need to deal with, um, we need to deal with the pests. We need to deal with what's going on with the tree uh, before we go out and try to deal with the fruit. Matthew 7, 17 and 18 says, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth, bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So the tree first. The tree first. <coughs> Excuse me. Your relationship with God is the first thing. And if that is correct, if that is right, 
If that has been put to rights, then the fruit is going to start taking care of itself. Address the tree, not the fruit. And if the examination brings you to a point of humiliation and regret, then take it as God's kindness to you. This is God's kindness to you. Psalm 141, verse 5 says, Let the righteous smite me. It shall be what? A kindness. Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head. My father was fond of saying, God takes you from where you are, not from where you should have been. And what you need in this moment, wherever you are, however far down the road you are, in your marriage, in your family, however, wherever you are, you need more than anything else, honesty and humility. You need that more than anything. You don't need a patch job. You don't need just to shuffle along to the next day. You don't need to kick the can down the road. You need more than anything else, humility, budgeting for the possibility that part of this might be you, and honesty. So, let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness. Let him reprove me, it shall be excellent oil, an excellent oil, which shall not break my head. So do not despair, and do not drop your name into that glorious passage, 1 Corinthians 13, that we just heard read this morning in the scripture reading. It's, that, that's an easy way to kick yourself around. Love is patient, love is kind. Put your own name in there. And, you know, I'm not patient, I'm not kind, I'm not, I don't suffer long, I'd, you know, uh, look, I'm just a... I'm just a miserable failure. No, don't overwhelm yourself with your own sinfulness. Put Christ's name in there and use that passage to look to him. He is the one who is going to teach you honesty. He is the one who is going to reveal the truth to you. And when the truth comes home to you, it's going to open your eyes. It's go- the tr- you, you shall know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth shall set you free. Truth is your friend. Lies are not your friend. Even if, the, even if you've got the rest of the family to go along with the lies, they're still not your friend. They're still, they're, they're still going to catch up with you at some point. And you might think, well, my, the kids still gather around the dinner table. We still, we're still together. Yeah, but that's because they're 10, right? That's because he doesn't have anywhere else to go. When he's 18, he can join the Navy. When he's 18, he can be on, on the other side of the world if he wants. And you can't, you can't measure how things are, are going now just because everybody's got hunkered down and has agreed to continue with the sham. No. So put Christ's name in there and then use that passage to look to him. Christ suffereth long and is kind. Christ envieth not. Christ vaunteth not himself, is not puffed up, <clears throat> doth not behave himself unseemly, seeketh not his own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That's how Christ is. Christ is your friend. I said earlier, truth is your friend. But Christ is the truth. And you look to him, he is going to bring the truth home to you in a way that is not going to destroy. The devil is an accuser. If you've confessed a particular sin you committed, and you've confessed it 182 times, and you still feel bad about it, that's, that's the devil. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us day and night before the throne. The Holy Spirit convicts us. And when the Holy Spirit convicts, as soon as we acknowledge, as soon as we get to the point of honesty, and we say, yeah, that was me. Yeah, I did that. As soon as that happens, what do you have? Forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. He does convict of sin. But the result of that conviction is confession and restoration. And that's the point when I'm urging honesty in your home, when I'm urging humility in your home and honesty in your home, I'm urging you to the point of restoration, to the point of forgiveness, to the point of things being put back in joint. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We acknowledge your goodness to us. I pray that as we meditate on these things, you would guide all of us here. We all have challenging situations. We all have challenging relationships. We all all have Uh, situations that we don't feel equal to. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would comfort us, encourage us. I I pray that you would help us be honest and help us be humble 
as we approach this set of issues. Father, we do this lifting up to you the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, The Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation teaches that this bread transforms into the body of Christ. So the bread itself, which you put into your mouth, is the body of Christ. We reject this doctrine and teach rather that the bread itself remains bread as you chew. And the body of Christ remains in heaven, where he is sat down at the right hand of the Father. Now one objection that might come our way runs like this. I, for one, don't want to feed on a mere similitude. I don't want to eat and drink that which has but a resemblance to the real thing. Unlike you Protestants, I want to taste the real thing. How should we reply to such an objection? The first thing to say is that while we do not believe that this physical bread is transformed into the body of Christ, we manifestly believe in the real body of Christ. His body is in heaven where it, is, where it still bears the scars of our salvation. Secondly, we do not feed upon the wind here at this table. By teeth, tongue, and jaws, we feed upon the bread on the table. And by faith, we feed upon the body of Christ in heaven. Do not make the mistake of thinking your faith can be fed by faith, or that your faith can be fed by mere ideas or concepts or rituals and liturgies themselves. No, the food for your faith is the real body and blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, this is a mystery. You can know it to be the case, but you will never be able to get your mind all the way around it. The real Christ, seated in heaven, feeds your faith with himself. Would you have greater faith? Would you have more abundant life? Then come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you have given us the bread of heaven. As we come to partake of the bread and wine on the table, feed our faith with your Son himself. For we come in Jesus' name. And amen. The charge is this one. As you go into these conversations, I'm assuming there'll be a number of them, one of the things you should be braced for, prepared for, is to be surprised. Right? Be ready for that. And that relates closely to the second thing, is maintain a sense of humor. Because some of these surprises are going to be really incongruous. You're going to discover, perhaps, things that everybody in the world knows about you and you don't. Right? That's funny. right? You also might think it's funny that you, you've, got, you've got some fraught relationships and you know, kind of think, you're kind of braced for the conversation to go poorly and I just, there's this territory between you and the other person and it's a, it filled with landmines and I just told you to strap on some snowshoes and go tromping across, <laughs> which I did. So this is something, this is something that God wants you to do. Maintain a sense of humor, let go of your dignity, and then and, and, and realize God loves you, you love each other, take it easy. God loves you, you love each other, take it easy. So, with believing hearts, receive the benediction of your God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.